A lot of people have been asking me when I'm going to do this series again because it's actually one of the most popular series on my channel and I've actually we took a break from it so that I can actually collect more data and bring you guys more interesting stations because you wouldn't want to go over the same things over and over again. So here's something new. This is season four, episode one, pediatrics. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to the Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at 10 Oski stations in one clinical course. Today we're going to be looking at pediatrics. This is season four, episode one. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment on our road to 6,000 subscribers. And a warning before you actually go on, viewer discretion is advised as there are some graphical images in the presentation and these are only intended for teaching purposes. You already know the drill of these videos. You may pause the video before I actually give you the answer. You can scream it at your screen. You can write it down on a piece of paper. You can discuss it with a friend if you are actually watching it with a friend. Grab your piece of paper. Let's go. Station one. This San neonate is a two day old at Levi Manawasa University Teaching Hospital, he was born nice and pink with an APCA score of 9 out of 10. And during the ward round, the consultant asks you to examine the feet of the neonate. You notice the above. Name the physical abnormalities you see. Mention the probable diagnosis using A, a common term. Part 2, a medical term for the condition. Part C, list three associated causes. Part D, list three complications of this condition. Part E, list any four things you're going to do for this patient. You may pause the video at this particular moment. And here comes the answer. So as you can see, both feet are rotated inwards and downwards. So this is what we refer to as club foot or clubbed foot. And the scientific name is known as Talipes equinovirus. The associated causes include oligohydramnios, spina bifida, teratogenic agents such as sodium aminotriptin. Then you may also have congenital constriction rings. Three complications may include atrophy of the leg muscles, most commonly in the peroneal group of muscles, contractures of the posterior ankle capsule, subtalar capsule, um, talonavicular, as well as the uh, calcaneocuboidal joint. You may have osteoarthritis later on, inability to walk normally, and you may also have complications that are related to the therapy, such as infections from the surgery, a vascular necrosis of the talus, as well as persistent intoing of the nails. The four things that you're going to do, obviously, you're going to counsel the parents and actually gain consent because this child may actually need surgical intervention. And remember that with telepase, you have two main forms. You have what is known as the easily correctable club feet then you have the one that is resistant that was what we call the resistant clapped fit then the easily correctable ones you want to actually perform manipulation you shouldn't actually use any force because you can actually fracture the bones you can do casting and splintage and this can actually be done two to three days after birth of course you want to get an x-ray after six weeks to confirm whether the foot is an easy clapped foot and meaning that it's actually reduced into the anatomical position or it's a resistant one which may actually need surgical intervention with the surgical intervention you may actually perform an incision using two types of incisions. You can actually use a Cincinnati incision or the um, the um, cervi, cervilinear medial as well as the posterior medial incision. Then you act after this, you're going to perform surgical release. And of course, this is for cases that are resistant. Station two, this neonate is 10 days old at, at University Teaching Hospital, UTH. It is your first day on duty after qualifying as a junior resident medical officer. During the ward round, you examine the neonate's mouth and you notice the above. So this is what you see. What is your diagnosis? What treatment will you give? And generally, what is the prognosis? What pathogen commonly causes this condition? Give the full name. List four predisposing factors for this condition. You may pause your video at this moment 
And here comes the answer. So this is most likely oral candidiasis or oral thrush. You want to treat this with oral nystatin suspension. So for those that are preterm, you can give 100,000 international units, six hourly, that's four times a day. And for the pre this for the premature infants, and then for the term infants uh, or the other infants, you're going to be giving 200,000 units four times a day. And remember that this is supposed to be painted into the recesses of the mouth. So the child should not swallow it, you paint it. The mother should actually, can actually use um, the finger, a clean finger and paint it into the mouth. Uh, remember that the child must avoid taking cold beverages. The prognosis is generally good, so you can actually treat it from as little as four to five days, sometimes it can even take up to two weeks. And of course, the pathogen that causes this is Candida albicans, and risk factors include male gender for some reason, birth asphyxia for some reason, prolonged use of antibiotic therapy because it gets rid of the normal flora and disturbs the normal flora in the system. Then of course, you have immunosuppression, which can be due to HIV, can be due to drugs, it may also be due to malnutrition. Moving on to station three. This neonate has been delivered at Kanyama General Hospital. It is your first day in NICU. You are asked by the nurse to see the neonate. Describe the one clear abnormality. Name two differential diagnoses. Describe three possible causes of the abnormality. What parameter will you monitor in this child? List four ways to help you distinguish the two diagnoses in question B. You may pause the video. Have a look at the picture and here comes the answer so this is of course the you have this abnormally shaped uh, head with the swelling and this is consistent with what we call a caput succedaneum and the two other differentials include a cephalohematoma as well as a subgaleal hemorrhage so you can actually even have the caput succedaneum and the cephalohematoma here because here they told you about one abnormality they didn't ask you about the diagnosis so you can actually put cephalohematoma caput succedaneum it can also be a subgaleal hemorrhage now this is as a result of forceps or vacuum delivery it can be due to oligohydramnios it can be associated with premature rupture of membranes as well as Braxton Hicks contractions. These are pretty much practice contractions that happen during pregnancy. The parameter that you actually want to monitor is a serum bilirubin because there's a risk of jaundice. Because remember that this is blood that is accumulating in this area. It gets broken down, releases the bilirubin, it gets further metabolized and this can actually deposit in the skin and the mucous membranes. Now the four ways in which we're going to distinguish these conditions, remember that with a caput succedaneum, you have this subcutaneous tissue hemorrhage. This is what's depicted on the picture above, these two pictures above. Then with the cephalohematoma, this is now blood that's going to be collecting between the periosteum and the skull. Then of course, with caput succedaneum, it's usually associated with the pressure on the fetal head during delivery, and it's usually present at birth. Then of course, with the cephalohematoma, this is due to damage of the blood vessels. This usually happens after birth. It's not really generally at birth, but it can also result from a traumatic delivery. And then of course, with the uh, uh, caput succedaneum, it usually crosses the suture lines. And as you can see, the mass is fluctuant. Then of course, in the cephalohematoma, it uh, doesn't cross the suture lines. The caput succedaneum usually takes a few days to resolve after birth, then the cephalohematoma usually takes several weeks. Then with the subgaleal hemorrhage, it's actually considered as an emergency because you have this blood that is accumulating between the epicranial aponeurosis as well as the periosteum. And this is obviously due to rupture of the emissary vessels and you have them bleeding into the subgaleal space. Now the whole thing about this is the complication is that the fetus can actually exangiate so they will present to you with hypovolemic shock because all the blood would have accumulated in this subgaleal space moving on to station four you are doing your clinical rotation from levy Mwanawasa university teaching hospital and you find your consultant performing the clinical examination shown in a and b on a seven-year-old boy Part A, in what suspected clinical condition would you perform these clinical examinations? Part B, clearly name the two examinations, A and B. Part C, if the two clinical examinations were positive, which confirmatory procedure would the consultant do? Part D, list four contraindications of the procedure in question C. Part E, how will you manage this patient? You may pause the video at this moment, and here comes the answer. 
So this is obviously done in meningitis. The two clinical signs, the one that's above is kerning sign. How do I remember this kernings? It sounds like a knee, so it means you should be doing something with the knee. So kerning sign, where you flex the hip, you flex the knee, then you attempt to extend the knee, then this is limited and you see that the head is going to come up. And with the Brzezinski sign, you, the, with the patient lying supine, and you passively flex the, the, the neck, and of course you're going to see the knees coming up. So this is the kerning sign. This is the Brzezinski sign. Obviously, the next thing that you're going to do if this comes out positive is you want to do a lumbar puncture. Contraindications of the lumbar puncture include cardiorespiratory instability, which may include hypertension, hypotension, respiratory distress. Second contraindication may include things like refusal of consent, infection at the site of the lumbar puncture, and certain bleeding disorders. And of course, how are you going to manage this patient? Remember, this patient has meningitis, so you want to start them on antibiotics. You want to start them on steroids, corticosteroids, for at least the first three days. And then you also want to give them seizure prophylaxis. And if they have any seizures, um, treat the seizures, cover the or start physiotherapy as early as possible, ensure that there's fluid and electrolyte as well as nutrition balance in this patient. Station five, you walk into the pediatric ward and you see your consultant carrying out the procedure shown in the picture. What is the procedure? What is a suspected diagnosis? List six different causes of the diagnosis above. List four possible complications of the procedure above. You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So this is obviously a lumbar puncture that is about to be done. And this is done in meningitis, just like in the previous question. Causes may be divided as bacterial, viral, fungal. Bacterial causes include Neisseria meningitidis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza. Viruses include Cytomegalovirus, Herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr virus. Fungal infections such as Histoplasma, Blastomyces, as well as Candida. Four possible complications of the lumbar puncture include the post spinal punctural headache, which is the most common complication, post dural puncture cerebral herniation, which is a feared complication. You may have a hemorrhage into the epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, and even have a bloody tap. Then you may have a dysesthesia of the lower limbs, which is due to irritation of the nerves and nerve roots. Station six, you are transferred to Marcha Mission Hospital and the patient above and the patients above have several episodes of non-bloody diarrhea for four days. You are transferred to the above center because there is an outbreak of this type of diarrhea. What is your most likely diagnosis? What pathogens cause this condition above? Name three things before you do any investigation that would support your diagnosis. Briefly outline four things you would do to manage these patients. You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So this is obviously cholera. A lot of them are sick. They look severely dehydrated and it's non-bloody diarrhea. So most likely cholera. It's one of the causes of outbreaks. It's most likely caused by Vibrio cholerae. And of course, three things that will suggest that this is cholera. Number one, they're going to be having a history of passing rice water stool. Number two, there will be a history of vomiting as well. Number three, they will have features of dehydration when you examine them. Then, of course, there will be a short history of an incubation period, usually even as short as 6 to 48 hours. Sometimes it can even be as long as 3 to 4 days. Then, of course, on the management, you want to isolate or admit the patient to an infectious disease center or an area as these patients are admitted. You want to assess the level of dehydration. You want to continuously monitor the vital signs. You want to rehydrate the patient and cover this patient's on antibiotics. Remember that cholera is one of the things that you may decide to start these children on antibiotics because it's going to reduce the morbidity and the mortality of the condition. Station number seven. You see this four-year-old patient who has had several episodes of diarrhea mixed with blood in the stew for four days. She has fever and is refusing to eat. She is not malnourished. That's the key term here, not malnourished. What is your food diagnosis? Name two pathogens that may cause this type of diarrhea. Show calculation to show expected weight for age or oh, the weight for this child. Name the most worrying complication of the diarrhea and show calculations how you're going to manage the complication. Remember, this is a four year old child and they are having bloody diarrhea. And here comes the answer.
so this is obviously severe dehydration as you can see this chart has sunken eyes of course it's looking a bit lethargic the other thing that this child is having is refusing to eat obviously she may also be refusing to drink so that's severe dehydration secondary to dysentery which is part of acute diarrheal disease two pathogens that may cause dysentery it may be bacillary dysentery which is commonly caused by shigella or it may be amoebic dysentery which is commonly caused by intamoeba histolytica then the calculation for the expected weight so i want us to switch now to a black screen so that we can actually calculate remember that the most worrying complication of this is dehydration so you want to assess the dehydration so let's go to a black screen first so that i can actually explain let me, let me use a white a whiteboard this time okay so let's get um, a pen okay so the weight of this child is going to be equals to 2 multiplied by the age plus 5. Okay, and remember that this child is 4 years old. So this child is 4 years old. So our weight there is going to be 2 multiplied by the age. This child is 4 plus 5. So it's going to be 2 multiplied by 4 plus 5 is going to give you 9. So 2 times 9 is going to give you 18 kg. And remember that this child is not malnourished. And they are weighing 4 kg. They're not malnourished. And obviously, they have severe dehydration. So for the rehydration, rehydration, remember that this child is above 1 year. So we we'll want to rehydrate them in 3 hours. Okay, in three hours. Then this child is not malnourished, so you can actually use your fluid of choice as your Ringer's lactate. If you don't have Ringer's lactate, you can use your half strength Dara solution in 10% dextrose. So, how are we going to calculate this? So, with severe dehydration, we're going to be so with severe dehydration, we're going to be giving 100 mils, we're going to be giving 100 mils per kg over three hours okay so we say the weight how much fluid is this child going to receive in three hours we're going to say 18 multiplied by 100 so this is going to give us 1800 mils so this 1800 mils is going to be given in three hours but remember we're going to be dividing this 1000 800 mils into 30 percent or 30 mils per kg to be given in the first 30 minutes then the remaining 70 percent is going to be given in the remaining uh, two and a half hours so if we actually get 30 percent of uh, 1800 we're actually going to be getting roughly around 540 so this child is going to be receiving 540 mils in 30 minutes okay 540 mils in 30 minutes then if you take 70 percent of that this child is going to be receiving 1260 mils in two hours 30 minutes okay then you're going to be reassessing the level of dehydration of this and once this child has received these IV fluids, then of course you can reclassify the level of dehydration and you move them to either your plan B or your plan A if they have some dehydration or if they have no dehydration. Station 8. It is your first visit to UTH and you are employed in the neonatal unit. You come across this two-day baby. What is the most likely diagnosis? What is the treatment? List three common causes of this condition. List three common complications of the treatment. If the baby was born to a rhesus-negative mother, what would be the most likely diagnosis? Give one useful test you would request for. Name one worrying complication. Should breastfeeding continue? If yes, why? If not, why? You may pause the video at this particular moment. And here comes the answer. So most likely this child has neonatal jaundice. Most likely unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. This is what we refer to as phototherapy. As you can see the blue light, this is a phototherapy machine. Then, of course, common causes of neonatal jaundice include neonatal sepsis, prematurity, breastfeeding jaundice. 
then I want you to comment in the section below how would you differentiate between breastfeeding jaundice and breast milk jaundice. Then of course, three complications of the treatment. You could develop diarrhea, you could have dehydration, and then bronze baby, syn bronze baby syndrome, especially if this is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And then if the baby was, the res was born to a rhesus negative mother, this will obviously be rhesus isoimmunization or hemolytic disease of the newborn. You want to order a Coombs test. Remember there are two types of Coombs test, a direct Coombs test and an indirect Coombs test. Again, comment in the section below what's the difference between a direct Coombs test and an indirect Coombs test. One worrying complication is severe hemolytic anemia. And of course you want to consider breastfeeding. They should continue breastfeeding because as we've noted from past research, hemolytic disease of the newborn is rarely actually associated with breast milk and the benefits of breastfeeding are actually outweighing the risks of the condition. Then moving on to station nine, this neonate is, this neonate is 14 days old at Mongu General Hospital. It is your first day on duty and during the ward round, the nurse asks you to see the child's sacral gluteal region. What is your possible diagnosis? Based on your diagnosis, what is the prognosis? List three differentials. You may pause the video at this particular moment and here comes the answer. So most likely this is a Mongolian spots or what we call dermal melanocytosis. The prognosis of this condition is generally good. Most of them actually disappear about 40 5% actually disappear within the first year. Three differentials are going to include blue nevi, dermal melanocyte hematomas, you may have nevi of ota and ito, as well as physical child abuse. Coming to the second last station, I added a bonus station for this because I know that you missed these series. So you're working from Chitokoloki Mission Hospital and a five-year-old child presents to you with the above rash which started three days ago and has been getting worse. What is your working diagnosis? What is the name of the virus causing the condition above? List three possible complications of this condition. List any four relevant things you are going to do for this patient. You may pause the video, write down your answer, and here comes the answer. So this is most likely chicken pox. The three things that I want you to be able to differentiate, chicken pox, small pox, as well as monkey pox. Chicken pox has the smallest of the lesions of the three. And usually it starts off on the face, spreads to, it starts on the, on the face, the trunk and the back, and spreads to the rest of the body. Then it is most likely caused by varicella zoster virus, which is human herpes virus three. Three complications include superadded bacteria infections, pneumonia. We actually lost a child that came in with chicken pox very recently at the hospital where I practice. Then you may have encephalitis, cerebral ataxia, disseminated intravascular coagulations. Four things that you're going to do. Obviously, you want to isolate this child. This child mustn't go to school. Analgesia, uh, as well as controlling the temperature or antipyretics. Give them antivaricilla zeus, the immunoglobulins. Acyclovia, especially for those that are immunosuppressed. Then of course, supplementation of vitamin A, D, C, and zinc. Here's the difference between monkeypox, chickenpox, and smallpox. Monkeypox is caused by monkeypox virus, chickenpox, varicella zoster virus, smallpox by variola virus. Remember that in monkeypox, you have fever and pus-filled boils first appearing on the face. Then here you have fever with an itchy rash first appearing on the chest, back, and the face. Then in smallpox, you have fever, small red spots on the tongue, as well as pus-filled boils on the face, arms, and the legs. The appearance of the symptoms is 5 to 21 days, with chickenpox is 10 to 21 days, smallpox 7 to 19 days. And they usually last for 2 to 4 weeks in monkeypox, 4 to 7 days in chickenpox, up to 5 weeks in smallpox. Fatality, most of the cases are 1 to 10% of them actually die, and that depends on the strain. It's quite rare with chickenpox, and up to 30% of the cases actually have severe forms of smallpox. And of course, the vaccine is suggested in all three of the conditions. Here's a bonus question. So you are in the pediatric ward and you find the setup shown in the picture. What is the setup called? List three indications of its use. What settings will you begin with? So this is the setup on the picture. You may pause the video at this particular moment. And here comes the answer. 
So this setup is known as bubble CPAP or bubble continuous positive airway pressure. It can be indicated when the child has increased work of breathing, regardless of you actually, or despite you actually putting them on adequate oxygen via your nasal prongs. Then of course you may have respiratory acidosis evident on arterial blood gases, pulmonary edema, apnea of prematurity. You generally want to start at six centimeters of water pressure and three liters per minute of oxygen. Here is other images or other setups of CPAP that may actually show up on your exams. So familiarize yourself with these machines. And here's our last question of the day and I want you to leave your answers in the comments below. I will pin the comment that actually makes the most sense on the video. So you are transferred to Kaputa and you find this gadget in the neonatal unit. What is this gadget? Name one situation when you would use this gadget. List three possible complications which may occur when using this gadget. Briefly describe any four pieces of clinical information you would be able to obtain during and after the procedure. Write down your answers in the comment below and I will pin the comment that makes the most sense after I review all the comments. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the bazooka. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications every time I post. We leave no one behind. Subscribe, share the comment, or actually share the content, comment and like to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.